Good morning. I had a really odd experience, a generational gap type experience. I avoid using the word old person experience. But I had this experience at a restaurant uh, this week. I was, uh, well, fast food. I don't know. I'm going to call that a restaurant. And so I'm looking at the menu, trying to figure out what I want. And the young man behind the counter said, I like your fit. And of course, I had no idea what he was talking about. And uh, so I'm trying, sitting here trying to process, the young, young people are like, I know what you're talking about. I'm trying to process this whole thing, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, so either he called me fit, which I was pretty certain that was not what he said, um, or I completely misunderstand and he called me fat, which is more plausible uh, than fit. Um, I had to actually Google it. Uh, it means he liked my outfit. And so I have determined that that's the last time I'm ever wearing my skinny jeans to any uh, restaurant or any public place. So, I, and, and by the way, I don't actually have skinny jeans except for the ones in the back of my closet that I hope that I get to wear again someday. Uh, but that was my, my experience. Um, these phrases, you know, I mean, I, of course, I used phrases when I was a kid that, um, you know, my parents had no idea what I was talking about. You know, every generation has its own way of uh, saying things. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are certain things that we kind of grow past, you know, and we, we don't think about them very much. Um, these elementary things, if you will. Uh, who, who would like to go back to elementary school? Now, if you're already in elementary school, you know, that's one thing. But anybody here want to go back? Nobody? If you're, you're older, if you're in college, if you're in high school, you really have no desire to go back to elementary school. That is not something we want to do. And it's not that those things were wrong. It's not that things we learned in elementary school were wrong. It's just that we've moved past those things, right? The things that we learned, reading and science and math, you know, we, we really don't want to go back and live there anymore. We, we use them on a daily basis. We've built on them. They're foundational. But we really don't want to go back unless we're teaching, you know, and, and relearn those things. Um, I don't think that I would be able to sit in my old desk anymore. It probably still has chewing gum underneath that I'm not suggesting you put chewing gum under your desk, but if you do, um, it's going to be there for a long time, let me tell you. But we, we don't want to go back. Those are elementary principles. Those are things that, that we have grown past. But I want to suggest to you that maybe, maybe elementary school, maybe you learned something that wasn't quite right. Okay? Maybe, maybe you were taught in your school and let's say everybody, I don't know why this would ever happen, but it's hypothetical. Maybe everybody was taught that one plus one equals three. And that was that was the teaching. Now, you and I know that's not right, right? I mean, it obviously equals four, right? Um, but you were taught one plus one equals three. And, and you have built everything. You've learned every mathematical equation. You know all the formulas. You know everything. But you have built it on that one fact quote unquote, that you learned in elementary school, one plus one equals three. Well, it doesn't matter how much you learn. It doesn't matter how advanced you become in your mathematics. You're wrong, right? And you're wrong because your fundamental principle, one plus one is three, is wrong. And because you've got that wrong, it doesn't matter what you do from that point forward. It doesn't matter what you learn unless you go back and you you relearn that foundational principle, you're going to be wrong in everything. That you're going to have problems in everything pertaining to math. And really the same is true in our, our Christian walk as well. There are foundational teachings. Foundational teachings that we need to learn, that we need to know, that we need to have in order to build on. Now we, we don't necessarily want to go back and relearn all of those things um, things again like we did when we were kids in Bible class or whatever, whenever you learned all those things. I mean, that's not really something that we, we necessarily want to do, but we need them in our maturity. We need to build on them. We need to continue growing. We need to make sure we got those foundational principles right. And as Christians, we need to grow. And, and there's, there is risk involved if a Christian doesn't mature. There, there's risk involved if they stay with the foundational elementary principles of faith. It's not that they're wrong, but it's just like an elementary student only learning the basic principles of elementary, and then that's it. They never advance past that. They never move on. They, they never get past those basic principles of elementary teachings. 
For a Christian, if we don't move past the basic elementary teachings into maturity, into growth, then there's a risk, there's a danger, there's a problem. And that danger comes from the reality that somebody else is going to come along and because we haven't matured, because we haven't grown, grown because we haven't advanced in our, in our maturity, then we leave ourselves vulnerable to an attack. Paul says it this way. This is uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. 14. He says, um, as a result, this is not maturing, right? This is a group that hasn't matured, but needs to mature. They are maturing. He says, as a result, you're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. Paul says, look, you need these teachings. You need to grow. You need to mature. You need to to grow up. You need to advance in your understanding. You need to take those foundational principles of faith and build on them and mature. Because otherwise, otherwise you're going to be carried away by by all these different doctrines. He uses the phrase, the wind of doctrine. Kind of like you're in a boat, you know, and, and you have no anchor. And and the wind blows, and the next thing you know, you're drifting further away from the shore. And, and, you know, it might be subtle at first, but but it's something that happens. And Paul's concerned about the brethren because they need to grow up. They need to grow up. But he also says there's people out there who are crafty, and they're deceitful, and they're wanting to sway you in one way or the other. And if you haven't matured, then you've left yourself vulnerable to their attacks. Hebrews chapter 6 is where we're going to be. If you want to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6 um, or follow along on the screen, whichever fits you best. But the Hebrew writer says this. He says, therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. These elementary teachings of Christ. Now, if you've been following along with our studies of Hebrews, you probably know already that that the primary concern is that we have some Hebrew brethren. They grew up under the old covenant, and they have these principles and ideas of, of how God works and their understanding of how they are to relate to God. And they are putting their faith, or have put their faith, many of them, in Jesus as God's Messiah, God's Christ. Well, the putting of one's faith in Jesus also brings them into a what they call a new covenant. It's a new relationship through Jesus. Well, in this new relationship, because of Jesus, there's not a necessity of a, a high earthly priest to go to, to offer sacrifices There is not a need for a temple. There's not a need for the feasts and the festivals in order to have a relationship with God. Those things have faded away. Those things have served their purpose. The reality and substance is found in the person of Jesus. And many of these Hebrews are struggling with this idea because they have grown accustomed to the feasts and the festivals and the temple and the sacrifices. That has been their whole life, their whole life. And they don't know how to process a relationship with God without that. And so the Hebrew writer is trying to encourage them to stay with Jesus and not to return back to the old system. And the elementary principles in this context is most likely the principles about the Christ that came from their understanding through the old covenant. Now that Christ has come, they have a greater understanding of Jesus. They have past the elementary teachings about the prophecies of the coming Messiah, and they have the Messiah as their foundational teaching. They need to mature past the tutor, which is the law and the prophets, and move into reality, which is the person of Jesus. And there's a struggle. They need to grow up. They need to mature. They don't need to go back to the elementary principles about the Christ. Look at verse 4. He says, For... In the case of those who have been enlightened, once been enlightened, they have tasted of the heavenly gift, they have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, they have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now, who are these people? Who are these people? They they, they have been enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift, they are partakers 
of the Holy Spirit, would you call these people Christians? Yeah, absolutely. The, these are Christians. That's who he is describing. These are people who have heard the gospel. They, they heard the good news. They've heard the teachings of Jesus. And they have believed it. They've been enlightened. They have come to the reality and faith that Jesus is the weighted Messiah. They have been enlightened. They have tasted of the heavenly gift, God's salvation through the Messiah. They are recipients of the Holy Spirit. These people belong to God. These people are Christians. These people have put their faith in Jesus. That's who they are. But then look at what he says in verse 6. And this is kind of the shocking revelation of, of Hebrews chapter 6, but it is a sobering reality. He says, and then have fallen away. They, they, they fell away. So what do they fall away from? Well, they have, if we're thinking about the Hebrew Christians, they have left the old system, rightfully so, and, and they have gone to the new system, the new covenant. They put their faith in Jesus. They no longer have faith in the sacrifices. They no longer have faith in the feasts and the festivals. They no longer have faith in the high priest as their mediator. They no longer have faith in the, the temple worship and all that took place with the old system. Not to say those things were wrong, right? Those aren't wrong. You know, it's kind of like us going back to elementary school. I mean, the, the information we learned wasn't wrong. It's just that we have matured past that to other things. We have grown up. And so these Christians have grown up. They have left those elementary principles, not jettisoned them or abandoned them, but they have moved on from those principles into faith in Jesus. So falling away for them would look like them going back to that old system. It would look like them leaving the new system, the new covenant, faith in Jesus, and moving back to the old system. They fell away. It, he says, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. So what they're basically doing is they're returning back to a time when before Jesus, that's their, that's their mindset, they're going back in time as if Christ hadn't come, as if Christ hadn't died on the cross, as if none of that had taken place. And they're going back over here, back in time, before the cross in their mind, and they're attempting to have a relationship with God on this side of the cross. The problem with that is, the cross has already taken place. Jesus has already died on the cross. He has already ascended into heaven to be our high priest. He has already been our perfect sacrifice for the atonement of our sins. He has already done those things. And so for them to go back to the old system is to crucify once again the Christ. They're making a mistake. They're making a mistake. They're trying to go back and they're trying to look for God. And in fact, they may even say to themselves, we're repenting of all of this nonsense of, of, of the new system and all the apostles' teachings. We're repenting and we're returning to the system that God gave us. They may call that repentance. Now the Hebrew writer is struggling. You know, he's, he's trying to explain to them, no, 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 no. You don't understand. It has been in God's purpose all along that through the old covenant would come the new covenant. That has always been part of God's plan. It's not new. It's not something the apostles created. It came from God. But when they go back to the old system and they look for God and they try to find him in the temple, he's not going to be there. When they try to find God in the sacrifices, he's not going to be there. When they try to find God in the feasts and the festivals, he's not there. When they try to find God in the establishment of the priesthood, he's not there anymore. He can only be found in and through Jesus. They have fallen away. When they leave the system that God has established in Christ for the system that God had established to lead his people to Christ. But what does this teach us? Well, for one, it teaches us 
the sober reality that a Christian can fall away. Now, we're not going to fall away in the way that they fell away. I mean, that's not possible. But it does give us the, the sober reality that through false teachings, through behavior, through all sorts of different things that we, could, we can do that are contrary to the gospel of Christ, that a Christian can fall away. We can leave Jesus. We can fall away from the relationship that we have in God. Now, why is that so important? Well, it's important because we need to know that. <laughs> it's not something we need to dwell on or we need to wake up every morning and think, man, I sure hope don't fall away today. We need to have a blessed assurance of our salvation, but we also need to be aware of the fact that what we let into our life, the teachings we let into our life, the people we let into our life, could result in us leaving or falling away. As Paul says, it's a, it's a matter, it's like a wind that blows, and if we're not mature and we're not careful and we haven't left those elementary principles, we run the risk of being blown away from the shore. Blown away. And it's not that somebody necessarily did it to us. We, we were participants. We actively participated. I love the fact, and I, know I, I harp on this often, but I love the fact that God will never leave us. I love the fact that Jesus is going to keep his sheep. I love the fact. I, you know, those passages in John are so beautiful. This idea that, that we just continue striving forward in faith, that we have this blessed assurance in Jesus. I love that. I need that. It needs to be foundational in our understanding of God. He's not going to abandon us. He's not going to leave us alone. He's not going to get tired of us. He's not going to say, well, he, he messed up one too many times. He's done. You know, he, As we continue to strive to do the will of God, I love the fact that God is not going to abandon us. But I need to understand the fact that I can abandon God. I can leave. I can choose. And sometimes those choices come from misinformation. Sometimes those choices come from false doctrines. Sometimes those choices come from other people influencing me to make choices that are not in conjunction with the will of God. It is a sobering reality that we can neglect and reject our faith. And in both... Paul, excuse me, both Paul and the Hebrew writer are making the point that it's really a result of not growing up. If you don't grow up, that's the risk. If we don't mature, that's the risk. If we don't continue to build on the foundational principles of Jesus, that's the risk. Are there times that we need to go back and relearn some foundational principles? Sure. Right? I mean, especially if you were taught that 1 plus 1 equals 3, you better go back and relearn that. That's wrong. And then continue moving forward. But we have to mature as Christians. We cannot sit stagnant. We cannot sit and listen to the preacher every single Sunday and expect that to be enough because, folks, that's not enough. That's not enough. We have to mature. You have to mature. It's your responsibility to learn and to grow in your faith in Jesus, to learn more about God's word, to grow in God's word, to grow in your understanding of salvation, to grow in your understanding of Christ. But look what he says. Look what he says. Oh, no, he didn't say it. Sorry. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to read it, um, but uh, apparently I, I missed it. Well, no, I didn't. I'm just out of, out of sorts. I got carried away. Uh, verse 7. If you want to look at verse 7 for just a minute, he gives this great illustration, and, and he talks about really just, you know, it's kind of a typical farm illustration that is uh, very prominent in these teachings, but he says, For the ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. Now listen to the illustration. I'll explain it in a minute. And then he says, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. And the point's really simple, actually. It's a little confusing that it sits here, but it's very typical. 
of this kind of writing, the point's very clear. It rains on everyone. It rains on every ground. Right? I mean, God sends the rain and it hits all kinds of different soil. And, and as we rightfully know in, in West Texas, sometimes, sometimes it grows beautiful green grass. And you, you cultivate it, you till it, you pull out the stickers, it does great. It's beautiful. But what else does it do sometimes? It's just weeds, <laughs> stickers, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time in my experience, that's what grows. But the point is, it's the same rain. It's the same rain. It's not that one group gets different rain than another group. It's the same rain. And his point is that what God has given, what God has brought, what he teaches is the same. It's not different. He's not teaching different for this group and that group. God is giving the message. It is coming from heaven. This new covenant relationship is for everyone. It's coming from God. And, and it's falling on all different groups of people. The Gentiles, the, the Hebrew Christians, the, the, the Hebrews who are not yet Christians. It's falling on all of these different groups of people. But it's the same rain. But it doesn't always produce the same fruit. Sometimes it's green grass. Sometimes it's productive. Sometimes it brings people closer to God through Jesus. Sometimes it's worthy of just being burned up because it doesn't always produce the same fruit. And that's not God's fault. God's not to blame for that. It's the people receiving. It's the recipients. It's the soil that the water falls on. That's the problem. That's the point. It's a sobering reality. But look what he says in verse 9. This, this is the good news, right? That's, that's, that's the bad news, right? There's a possibility of falling away. There's a possibility of ignoring the blessings of God. There's a possibility of leaving one's faith. That's the bad news. That's the warning. But then quickly he comes to the good news and he says, Beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation, though we're speaking in this way. He said, don't, don't let us talking that way just totally destroy you. Don't let it, you know, it's important. You need to know it. You need to be aware of it. But he says, brethren, I, I know you. And I know you know you. And, and I love you. And God loves you. And I, I know the relationship that you have with each other. I know the relationship that you have with God. I want to warn you of the possibility of leaving, of falling away, of the danger that, that is approaching you. I want, want that to be a warning, but I also want to encourage you. He says in verse 10, For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name, and having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. He said, All of, although this, this teaching is out there, Although there are people who are influencing you with this false doctrine that you need to return back to the old system. Although that you're even thinking about it. I mean, you've kind of thought about it. You probably had some conversations with your wife at home about it. And it's been stirring in your mind. You know, I don't know. That has been such a foundational doctrine for so many years. It's what I've always been taught. It's what I've always believed. It's what my grandfather believed and his grandfather believed. It's, it's what everybody believes. I mean, why would I think any different? The Hebrew writer says, I know that's in your mind. I first want to warn you about the danger of letting it stay there. I want to warn you about the danger of letting it taking up residence in your mind. I, I want to warn you about the danger of trying to reconsider some of these foundational principles that we have taught you, that you have believed, that you have grown in. I want you to grow up and mature in those things. I don't want you to go back and reconsider because somebody else is bringing some information that we didn't bring to you. I want you to be careful, but I also want you to understand that we know you. And we're encouraged by you. And we see what you're doing. And we want you to remember this very important fact. Here's the important fact. God is just. God is just. 
the world thinks it knows justice, and we, we have some skewed view of what's right and what's wrong. But we have to recognize the great judge above, he is always just. He is always fair. He always makes the right choice. He always makes the right decision. That can both be somewhat terrifying sometimes when we find ourselves on the wrong end of that, or it can be incredibly encouraging when we have been striving to do the will of God. We recognize the God in whom we serve knows that, sees that, and is just. So the justice of God is the foundational principle behind our com conviction and confidence in our faith. Here's the reality. <laughs> You know, as long as we're concerned, and that's really the, the big issue, isn't it? You know, we're concerned. We, we long to do the will of God. We desire. We have a deep down inside of us this desire to do the will of God. Even though the writer is speaking as if these people who have fallen away can never be brought back. And that's, that might be a reality. And let me, let me kind of paint it this way for you. They've come from the old system, and they went to the new, and they went back. The Hebrew writer says that, that, that next turn, back, back to the new system where Jesus is, yeah, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Once they make that journey back to the old system, they're stuck. I don't know why. I, I don't know if it's because of pride. I don't know if it's because, I, I don't know. I don't know. But everywhere in Scripture, when we talk about repentance, everywhere in Scripture, when we talk about our relationship to God as Christians, the Bible talks about the reality that if we can humble ourselves, if we can confess our sins, if we can be repentant of our sins, there is always an opportunity to return back to God, no matter what we did. Is it going to be hard? Yeah. You know, are there times when we become so engrossed in a lifestyle that it's seemingly impossible for us to get out of it? Yeah. We had to be careful about that. But the reality is, repentance is a reality for Christians. And as long as we desire to be part of God's relationship, as long as we desire to do what's right, as long as we have this hope and we continue in faith and we move forward and we're striving to do the will of God making the necessary sacrifices, doing what's right, repenting of our sins continually. It's not just a one-time thing. Confessing our sins to God. We can have this incredible relationship with Him without constant fear, with this constant idea in the back of our head, knowing that we have a blessed assurance in faith. Look at verse 11. He says this, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize, listen, the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The full assurance of hope. Full assurance. Now, not a partial assurance, but a full assurance. A full assurance of hope. But I want you to think about these, these three things. This is how he, he encourages the brethren to do this. This is what you need to do. Be diligent. Be diligent. Do what needs to be done. <laughs> Go about, continue, move forward, be diligent. But then what else is there? He says, faith. Through diligence and faith. And what's the third one? Patience. Diligence, faith, patience. That's what's going to keep us on this path until the end. That, that's what's going to help us maintain this beautiful relationship. And I'm even hesitant to use the word maintain because really the relationship comes fully from God. But there's a responsibility on our part that I can only describe as maintenance. We can maintain a relationship with God. How? Diligence. Faith, patience, striving to move forward no matter what the circumstances may bring. I like the way the NIV translates it. He says this, We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what 
you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. He, he doesn't want us to just become sluggish, to become lazy, to, to neglect our life, to say, well, I learned all the basics. I'm good. That doesn't fly with anything, right? You're never going to go to a mechanic and the mechanic said, you know, I went to mechanicing school. I learned all the basics. Well, when's the last time you worked on a car? I don't know, 15 years ago. No, <laughs> you're not working on my car because you haven't grown past that. You're just elementary. I don't care where you went to school. We have to mature. We have to grow. We have to live the life if we desire to have the result. And then he uses Abraham as an example. He says, for when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could not swear by no one greater, he swore to himself or by himself, saying, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. How long did he wait? Well, he was 75 when he heard the promise. Isaac was born 25 years later. That's a long time. Diligence, faith, patience. Verse 17. He says, In the same way God desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. God is just, but God is also unchangeable in his commitments. And also that, that, that phrase, God can not lie. His promises are so assured to us. They're so confident. They're, they're so much a reality. Unlike anything that we've ever heard before. God is perfect in his bringing of his redemptive plan through Jesus to humanity. That, that's where our hope lies. That's where it rests. That, that, the reality of God promising us salvation is the hope in which we have. In fact, the Hebrew writer says it this way. He says it best. For those who are, are swaying by the wind, for those who are being driven by the different doctrines who are trying to push them away from the shore of the foundational teachings about Jesus and the reality of the relationship to God, the Hebrew writer says this about that situation. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. That's where we need to be. Holding on to this hope of the reality of the assurance of the salvation that we have in Jesus. Holding on to our hope. And the writer says, as long as we're doing that, as long as we have that as foundational and that as the thing that is keeping us, it's an anchor. It keeps us from being drifted away by different doctrines and ideas and thoughts and concerns and philosophies. It keeps us secure where we are. Then he says, and the one which enters within the veil. Now we've talked a little bit about this, but this is the reality of the faith that we have put in a person that has gone beyond this world into the presence of God. And that's where our faith lies. In verse 20, he says, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In other words, where he has gone, we're going to follow. That's the assurance we have. Because he has gone, we get to go too. And so this morning, these are the things I want you to consider. Is there a reality that a person can fall away? There is a reality. It's a sobering reality. Do we have to wake up terrified? No. No. <laughs> We can mature, we can grow, we can do the things necessary to, to have that blessed assurance, the hope that is an anchor to our soul. And these are the three things that I want us to remember. As we're walking in faith, to be diligent, to have faith, and to be patient. Knowing that God is just, knowing that he is unchangeable, 
knowing that he cannot lie, and knowing he has promised his people salvation. The full assurance of hope until the end. So what's the conclusion of all of that? <laughs> Let us press on to maturity. Let us grow up. Let us mature. If there's anybody here this morning, maybe, maybe you've been struggling with your walk in Christ and you need assurance. Maybe you need some encouragement. Maybe you need some prayers. Maybe you haven't put on Jesus in baptism. Maybe you haven't become a part of the family of God. Whatever your need might be this morning, if you would come forward as we stand and as we sing.